ataxic dysarthria. Ataxic actually means lack of uh, order, which suits quite well, as you'll see in this video. The mechanism of ataxic dysarthria, it's not one that affects the direct motor pathway. It's not one like spastic or upper, unilateral upper motor neuron that affects the upper motor neuron or the lower motor neuron directly, as in flaccid dysarthria. It's one that affects the extrapyramidal system, um, which is, you know, the basal ganglia, the cerebellum, those parts of the brain that do affect movement, but not the direct route. So ataxic dysarthria is caused by damage to the cerebellum. And the cerebellum here, its job is to help time and coordinate movements. Not just speech movements, but all movements. So essentially what the cerebellum does is take um, input from the motor plan and it also takes input from sensation, what's actually happening in the body. And it combines both of those and it tries to make them actually match by adjusting movements. Now remember just how complicated speech is. It is the most complicated thing the body does and don't let any physio or anyone else tell you otherwise. Um, this is an MRI of real-time speech and you'll see just what's happening. Welcome to the Science Gallery of the Max Planck Society. So if you just think about all the things that are happening during speech, all at the same time being coordinated. So we can speak up to kind of 14 phonemes per second roughly. Um, you need to be breathing in and out the right amount. You have, have to have enough air left for that sentence. You need to turn your voice on and off between different voiced and voiceless phonemes. You need to change your pitch appropriately across um, and your loudness across the word and across the whole sentence. Uh, you need to move your jaw accordingly. Of course, your tongue's moving rapidly. Your lips as well move very fast and your soft palate has to open and close appropriately. All this is happening at the same time and it's all being coordinated precisely. So the cerebellum is not about actually planning these out. The plan is already produced in the prefrontal cortex. So the cerebellum takes care of, roughly speaking, timing and force. And you think about what would go wrong if the timing in speech is off or the force is off or both. So it makes sure the articulators are where they should be, as forcefully as they should be, for as long as they should be, exactly when they should be. So the best analogy I could come up with was a conductor. The cerebellum is like the conductor. It doesn't actually write any music. It's already written. You know, the motor plan is already there. Um, and it doesn't actually do any of the music itself. That's, that's carried out by the muscles, which are controlled by the neurons. But it checks the music against the score or the cerebellum checks the motor plan against what is actually happening. So it takes the sensory information, checks it against the motor plan and makes adjustments as needed. It does this through feedback and feed forward. Um, this is another analogy I'm going to try. To me, this is an absolute nightmare. I would fall off a bike like this in like seconds. Uh, this video by Trail Peak shows some people riding um, across some pretty rough terrain. If we slow it down, we can get uh, some ideas about feedback and feed forward. Now, obviously they've got a plan as they drive. They're going to plan to go a little bit left and a little bit right around the corner, and they might have a rough idea in their head of the speed. But as they go, they're getting feedback. So maybe the handlebars adjust slightly and there's a bump here and there, and um, they get information about the position, the actual position of the bike compared to the intended position of the bike. And they make adjustments based on that. That's feedback, but there's also feed forward. They use the information to plan further ahead to what hasn't happened. So they might look ahead to this little bump here and change the plan because actually the bike's further left and they're going to have to turn the handlebars further forward to meet the next bend. So feedback is adjusting things based on information and feed forward is adjusting future things based on information. Or feedback is reactive and feed forward is anticipatory. So our cerebellum is a conductor slash BMX rider, but what I'm trying to convey is that it adjusts, is that it makes adjustments to fit the plan. Um, an example in speech would be if perhaps you've got, um, perhaps you have a mouthful of chocolate and you realize that your tongue isn't able to reach where you thought it would reach at the same time. So you're making adjustments to ensure it is where it should be, when it should be. All right, so let's just talk quickly about the anatomy 
of exactly what's happened or the physiology. So if you were to cut the cerebellum away from the rest of the brain, kind of here, uh, it would look something like this. So you've cut one side onto here and one side that way down the middle. So you've detached it. And where it joins, they call these little uh, sections peduncles. And they've divided them into three. So you've got the superior, superior, the middle peduncle, and the inferior cerebellar peduncle. So there's three. And the inferior peduncle is kind of the input from the sensory information from the body. So it will, it will come into the cerebellum via this. And the sensory information will be obviously auditory information about what you sound like, um, sensory information from the articulators and um, parts of the body involved, um, maybe some proprioception for your tongue, etc. So that's in to the cerebellum via the inferior peduncle. And then that motor plan we were talking about comes in uh, via the middle peduncle. So that's where you get your motor plan or the rough blueprint of, of what the brain wants to achieve with the speech or other actions. Like so. So that's also going in. So it's getting those two inputs and then the cerebellum does its little calculations and compares the two, compares the sensory information with the motor plan. Um, and then it also calculates the adjustments that are needed. Um, quite, quite quickly. And then that information comes out via the superior peduncle. So it comes back out of the cerebellum. My 3D arrows are not too good. So there's two inputs and one output. The two inputs, one from the cortex, one from the sensory information, it calculates, it makes adjustments, and then sends those back out to the body. And it actually sends it in two directions. Let's just zoom out a bit. So the direct, the corrections coming out of the cerebellum they go to the cortex via the thalamus. They also go directly to the lower motor system via the extrapyramidal roots. So it's kind of adjusting things directly, but also via the cortex. All right, let's talk about what other causes. So the causes inc include Friedrich's ataxia, lovely handwriting. And this is a progressive and hereditary disease. There's also spinocerebellar ataxias and they've been linked to genes so you can have genetic tests and there's um, lots of different subtypes you know they've all got numbers you know type uh, I don't know what they are but type 20 type 24 um, and they may affect speech or they may just affect um, more gait or a combination e each one has a slightly different presentation uh, stroke particularly in the cerebellum or, or around the peduncles Traumatic brain injury, because it's got such diffuse uh, damage all over the place, that can definitely result in ataxia. Uh, brain tumours. Um, a very common one is multiple sclerosis. You either get spastic or ataxic or a combination. And then there's another condition called multi-system atrophy, which is a fairly rare atypical form of Parkinson's. And that can result in ataxic, particularly if it's MSAC, MSA cerebellar. And another one is toxicity. So uh, one form of tax toxicity is alcohol. So long, long, long-term alcoholism. So people who um, are drunk for large stretches of their life for many, many years will eventually damage their cerebellum to the point where they might have ataxic dysarthria all the time. So people will assume they're drunk even when they're actually not. And also lead toxicity, mercury toxicity. So they're the causes, and let's talk about what does it sound like perceptually. Um, you want to look out for kind of irregularly inaccurate sounds. What I mean by this, I mean, this is a key difference. This is a key distinguisher of ataxic from other dysarthrias, is there might be mistakes, but they, it's, it's kind of not the same mistake twice. And you'll see what I mean when we go to the samples. So this feature applies to articulation in particular. Um, so there's errors in the way their speech is produced, but it won't be the same way twice. They might have a distorted S, you know, like a sh, 
but the next time it's it's it sounds fine, but it's prolonged. So, s- and the next time it's almost a plosive. S- um, consonant clusters in particular are difficult, and they often get cluster reduction because it's just too much to coordinate those three in a row. And because you need alignment of so many body parts at once, it's too much for the cerebellum to handle. And then the other one is prosody. Prosody is distorted because um, vowels and consonants may not be the right length or the right force. So it sounds wrong, even though there might be good intonation, the timing of everything is slightly off or the force is slightly off. So, for example, this might include schwa or other unstressed syllables that would normally be compressed being too long. So instead of compressed, they might say compressed. Or maybe syllables are overstressed, so compressed. Sometimes they're compressed, sometimes they're prolonged. It's, it's Again, it's irregularly inaccurate. There's no one feature. So you'll see features written for ataxic such as equal and excess stress where they, in order to make the articulation really accurate, they slow down and they say in each syllable really carefully, but it costs them their normal prosody. Uh, you might get prolonged phonemes, you might get prolonged intervals between phonemes, and generally you have a slow rate. And in particular, multisyllabic words are more likely to show these features because it's more planning, it's more coordination to come out with longer words. And in some people there um, are reports of a harsh kind of strangled voice, um, problems with coordinating their respiration and mono pitch, mono loud features. So they're still looking into whether there are subtypes of, dysarth- of ataxic dysarthria and they do seem to be kind of grouped around articulatory and prosodic, 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 pros- prosody based. As far as um, alternating motion rate, which I do have some recordings of, they also tend to be either irregular, um, but they also have a slow turning point. So let's have a listen to some now. All right, now these are really old recordings taken from like cassette tape to digitized, so forgive the quality, but it does it does demonstrate alternating motion rate in ataxic dysarthria. So have a listen to this one and listen to... Uh, the irregular rhythm or timing of the AMR. So you can hear he's, he's, it's not an even rate. It's not k- 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 k. it's not just slow. It's actually all over the shop in terms of rhythm. If you put that on a spectrograph, you'd probably see that the spaces between each syllable are not equal. The next one demonstrates irregular errors. So if you listen carefully, you'll hear she doesn't make kind of the same articulatory error twice in a row. So there's kind of an echo in the recording, but you can hear she's kind of like the the plosive part of the P is bigger, smaller, too soon, too late, etc. And you could be you could be forgiven for thinking that maybe she's had something to drink. Um, and and she's kind of maybe slowed it down there to try to make them more accurate, but they're still a bit variable. So that's that irregular inaccuracy we were talking about. The next one is a bit of both. It's it's both um, got poor rhythm and irregularly inaccurate in the articulation. So it shouldn't really be that hard to produce the same syllable over and over again accurately and with a certain rhythm to it. But in ataxic dysarthria, that is difficult. Pretty bad recording, but you get the idea. Again, irregular and irregularly inaccurate. You can really hear in that one the plosive 
uh, aspiration varying a lot. Sometimes it's really strong, sometimes it seems to vanish. I'll just go back a bit. <laughs> I think with the Kurt, he's actually not always achieving a complete stop. Sometimes it's more of a fricative because um, he's not articulating very accurately. So, obviously, the brain is having trouble making sure the tongue is where it should be, when it should be. And that one's even clearer with the timing. That's not at all equal intervals between them. So that one you can hear she's having trouble coordinating the phonation at the right time with the articulation and also the place of the tongue for k. All right, this is Joanne who, well, she'll explain, but um, have a listen to her speech. Hi, my name is Joanne Gomez and I have cerebellar ataxia. I was diagnosed about eight months ago and I have a speech problem and an articulation problem and I have a gait problem. I sometimes for, I'm forgetful and my speech sounds like I have a bunch of marbles in my mouth. Um, I walk with a cane occasionally. I'm very vain, so I don't use cane as often as I should. Um, also, I take IVIG, and that medicine helps suppress my symptoms. Um, that's about it. My husband says it's like flowers for Algernon. After I take my medicine, I sound completely better. So just have a listen to that bit again. For Algernon, after I take my medicine, I sound completely better. So some of the syllables are probably too short and some of them are too long. Same with the phonemes themselves. Some of them are extended past where they should be. Some of them are um, compressed. But overall, it varies between words. Sometimes the speech is good and then a little bit later, it's, it's um, more dysarthric. And this is Joanne about four years after that recording and you'll hear um, a difference. Hi, it's Joanne. Thank you for watching. Uh, I just wanted to check in and let you know how things are going so far. Um, I take my uh, IVAT on Monday. Um, I'm doing okay. I, um, you know, my speech has gotten a little worse and I have a rough time with that. But, you know, I try to do my best. And I try and, and still be everything I can be and do everything I can do. I still work out and eat right and um, everything like that, you know. I have a hard time with words. My gait, it's like MS, what I have, you know. Sometimes it comes and sometimes it doesn't and I go back and forth. You know, sometimes I use a walker, sometimes I don't have to at all. But then when I don't... People ask me, you know, what's wrong with you? you know, and a part of a handicap, and they want to know why, and because I don't look handicapped. Well, what looks handicapped, you know? I so Joanne gave me permission to share these videos. She's a legend. Thank you for that, Joanne. This video is a good example of quite variable speech. The I think the biggest thing that we've had to come to grips with is a role reversal in that I've been used to uh, ranging far and wide. I had my own truck if I wanted to go. So the start of his sentence there was actually super clear and, and didn't sound too bad at all. And then the second part of it uh, was a bit less clearly articulated. So you can see how much he's varying. Some place and do something. I did it. Very independent. Very independent kind of guy, yeah. All of a sudden, I'm not so independent. Mm. 
uh, not only in that regard, but increasingly in, I'll call it the small things, in support of myself. Mm -hmm. or and personal care issues. Personal care issues, yeah. For example, I can't button a shirt anymore. So you'll see me in t-shirts and pullovers. So you could take, uh, S is always a good example because it, it needs to be just right. You could take multiple different S's of his and compare them and they'd all be a bit different. But you have a nice shirt on today, yeah, this by one, the way. Yeah, this one says a taxi or bust or something like that. Uh, I am the strength behind a taxi. Yeah. Uh, I, I have difficulty zipping a zipper. You would say, well, if you can't button, use a zipper. I can't find the tab on the zipper to even pull it. I've designed a little string now that I, I use a fishing lure and a shoestring and I attach those to zippers so I can get a hold of them. So this video is more of a demonstration of the um, ataxic prosody. So have a listen to the prosody in this one. Well, ataxia in itself just means unsteadiness. So it could be a symptom of like MS or Parkinson's, but um, ataxia in its true form, there's two types of ataxia, Friedrich's ataxia, which usually affects younger children, and it also affects the heart, um, so several people I know have died of heart attacks, and co coordination. Um, so although there's some articulatory errors, the main feature is really that uh, slow scanning speech. All the syllables are the same duration. None of them are compressed and compressed or unstressed, really. Uh, and this last one, it's always a good experiment to see if you can pick up dysarthria in a language you don't speak. This one is Spanish, not Portuguese. I can tell the difference sometimes. Um, and you can hear there's some fenatory in coordination in this one. So during the progression, the attacks it. Una paciente pasa a ser varios symptoms or varios dudas con la taxi. La primera es la equilibrio. Nosotros perdió la capacidad de marchar. And I'm not sure because I don't speak Spanish, but it sounds like perhaps the syllable length is not quite right. Um, and possibly there's some spastic, like there's some real strain present in that voice. So the shortcut for ataxia is, um, and you need to be careful about how you say this one, but generally people with ataxic dysarthria will somewhere in your mind remind you of uh, someone who's speaking while drunk. Which is not to say their condition has anything to do with alcohol, and unfortunately, some of them aren't served alcohol because they're assumed to be drunk. But that is the overall kind of impression. Obviously, there's a lot more to it than that, but that is the kind of quick shortcut. So remember, it's not weakness. It's not reduced range, but it's irregular in coordination. And another really good description is dragging and blurred. So that should give you some idea of what the kind of feel for ataxic dysarthria is, what causes it, uh, and how it works as far as the brain mechanisms.